All right, y'all. Welcome back to the Fearless Podcast. This is episode 81, and I am still having technical difficulties with my soundboard, but I'm very excited to welcome back Billy Bond from the Permaculture Pimpcast. Yo, Billy, how you doing, brother? I'm good, man. I'm glad to be on with you. Um, it's uh, more out up here because we're going at 100 miles an hour, as you can imagine. I mean, between this uh, hurricane damage and everything else going on around here, but Honestly, you know, hearing about the good news that's going on in other places around here, you know, the good news in your family and the good news with my family and my grandbaby got to hang out with her when William was out here with my grandbaby with her first birthday. So it's, I mean, despite all the tragedy that's going on around this place, man, I got to say it's, 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 it's a real joy to be on with you and connect again, because, uh, you know, great, as you know, great conversation is always the things you and I look for, and it's sometimes the last thing we find. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I appreciate you taking the time. I thought uh, you we could come on here and maybe talk a little bit about what y'all are doing out there and your remediation strategy for kind of like fixing this pollution problem that's occurred out there, because this is a, a very, um, relevant topic to everyone else with all of these other explosions happening and then what they're actually injecting into the atmosphere. I thought it was a really good topic and something that we could discuss. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, it's truly amazing how much of this was, you know, it's, it's been a roller coaster ride ever since this whole thing happened in Western North Carolina um, to just kind of summarize in the nutshell, you know, you've had Dane Wigington on your show, which by the way, was a great interview and um, I had him on mine as well. And I've had the opportunity to get to know him a little bit better. You know, I, I get to call him from time to time and pick his brain about certain things. You know, when you get down to brass tacks, think about this, TD. We had the equivalent of two years of all of the water that goes over Niagara Falls in two years happened in two hours right here in this spot of Western North Carolina. Now, um, it's unprecedented. Nobody's ever seen like this, anything like this in modern times. And the crazy thing about it, when you overlay that disaster, let's just say, okay, I don't think you knowing enough about knowing what I know about you and you knowing about me and both of us having interviewed Dane, I'm not believing for a moment that any of this stuff is a coincidence. So let's just, what if I told you, what if I told you, and I got the receipts on this, that a year to a year and a half ago in northern South Carolina, in four different counties, lithium production for battery plants were all of a sudden approved. These battery lithium battery plants were all of a sudden approved over the last year and a half prior to this happening. So if you look mm -hmm. at the map, it really gives you a better understanding where all of the mining is intended to happen in eastern Tennessee, western North Carolina. And then all of the routes, which are on main thoroughfares, that go right down to these plants that just happen to just happen to be located in um I you know, I guess these people are clairvoyants. I mean, I guess we got Edgar Casey or a bunch of remote viewers or something or whatever whack jobs they got working for them. Uh just knowing that we were just gonna have this calamity that would happen to poison all the soil, poison all the farms, all these people, these old boys that they've been these lithium companies have been hitting up for the last um three decades who have said no because the roots run deep here man you got people that are on these properties going on seven generations many of them were already living hand to mouth but they were there is no way on earth they were ever going to sell this land they are that close you know uh to this land generationally and i know some of these people so i guess we just had this a coming uh you know this storm just happened to come up here park itself you know, and then we're seeing all this crazy stuff that nobody's ever seen before where Bear Independent was talking to me and we're seeing tornadoes on the opposite side of mountains. As you know, you live in Texas. I grew up in Oklahoma and Texas and all those places. Well, I have never seen a tornado that didn't come from southwest to northeast. In most cases, I, I have never seen it go otherwise. Mm -hmm. but somehow we got tornado damage on mountaintops in a place where there is no history of tornadoes. And Bear said he quit counting after 60, from with him flying over in the helicopter, 60 to, uh, tornado damage spots on the opposite side of mountains. Instead of being on the southwest side, it's on the northeast side. 
So it makes, or the Northwest side, it makes zero sense in all these different mountaintops. Now, it's a good thing you're wearing a blue shirt right now for the people that are listening in audio. I just happen to be wearing black. So if they decide to go ahead, because I'm saying too much right now, um, you're going to be safe when they hit you with that directed energy weapon because you're wearing blue. And I don't yet have a blue roof on my house. So, um, <laughs> you know, when you get down to brass tacks with all this stuff, there's a whole lot of coincidences going on. And, and I'm putting that in quotations, coincidences going on right now. And um, we are seeing things that are unbelievable. Now, I, I live in a town called Mars Hill. It's not far from one of the areas that was hard hit, and that was Marshall. And it just happens to be located along the French Broad River, where all of these toxins have basically gone into the river. Now, just to give you a sit rep of what happened there, and this these numbers are a month old, so just consider this. At that time, when I had good solid numbers, at that time, we had two dead dogs that people had foolishly brought on site, their dogs. Um, we had 50 to 60 people hospitalized for uh, lung problems that they couldn't explain and also um, abrasions that were somehow becoming messed up that we couldn't explain. And in addition to that, we have, um, oh, shoot, rubber, black rubber boots that are coming back green. Yeah, makes no sense on any of that. And we had a one lady lost half of her goat flock because they just happened to get down in the mud. They didn't even drink the water. They just got down in the mud. Mm. Now, we've had numerous people down there. They're wearing the best PPE they can find on the shelves. It's still not sufficient. And um, we got people that, that are basically coming out here, working for a day or two in Marshall, and then they just kind of did him out. They head on down the road. And uh, here we are in this weird place where there's – Tons of cleanup that needs to happen. We're not getting a dime of FEMA money. I don't know if one person, not one person who's gotten that 750 bucks, that whopping 750, and then the temporary unemployment for all these people that are displaced, not one person I know of has been able to get the unemployment. So it's like they're going to starve these people out. I mean, one way or another, they're going to try to get them out of here. Mm -hmm. And that's where, that's where people like us come in. Um, the can-do people like yourself, like me, and like the people we know. And so this is where it gets a little bit hairy because I'm dealing in an area where we have a lot of well-meaning people, but they have zero background on remediation. And when I say remediation, I'm basically saying, how do we take these toxins that we know exist? Um, and they're, I mean, it, it's still there. I was there on site, on one of the sites, a different site, uh, day before yesterday, um, no, it was yesterday, actually, as a matter of fact. And um, and then the day before that, actually, I was there both days. We were out on site and, um, you know, we're still seeing some of the same effects. Now, the cool thing is we can't get any reliable testing done by the state, by the federal government. And if we did, would you, te would you trust it? Because I wouldn't. Right. So we went out there. We were fortunate enough. The good Lord basically knew that I was inept for any of this. Now I kind of understand why Moses was like, okay, um, I'm really not cut out for this because um, I've been feeling that pretty much the whole step of the way because we have people that are meaning well, but they have no idea where to go. Nobody knows what to do. And the only person that even has any inkling of what to do, sadly, is myself. Um because this is part of what we do when we make compost, because that's the backbone of how we go. I'll get into the remediation steps in a minute. I just want to tell you, that, um, give you a sit rep on um, the things that are unfolding. So we could not find, Dane Wigington himself could not find a reliable lab for us to get test results, whether it was the water coming through the river or whether it was the soot that was deposited on the, on the land. So we've been unable to get any reliable, to find a lab that we could trust reached out to Mike Adams extensively. You even helped me with that. And I don't know whether he's busy or whether this he's just up to his eyeballs or whether he's just not interested. I don't know, but we can't seem to get him on board. Um, so as the Lord opened this door for me, right when I'm about ready to say good night, um, it's kind of hard to remediate something. If you don't know what's in it, then out of nowhere, Neethi, a friend of mine who happens to run the food church in eastern North Carolina, her husband just happens to be an environmental engineer. 
Well, and he just happens to know reliable labs. So he came out with his crew and, you know, he came out here and they did some serious testing or at least got samples. And then the lab, the, the, the samples were dropped off at the labs actually today. So we got 10 days before we know the actual results. So far, based on his expert experience um, and having done this numerous times, He's like, man, this water, it already, I mean, it just smells like things are dead in this water. And this land, it, it doesn't look wonderful. So they basically got all, all of our samples. We got it off to a lab. So thank God that part's done. The hard, I, I would have thought that would have been the easy part of all this. But so far, that's proven to be one of the toughest things is to find. So if people think we live in a very free country where nobody's bought and paid for Tell me why it's so doggone difficult where Dane Wigington himself can't find a reliable lab. Um, and then everybody else is working in the employ of either the federal government or they're working. We can go through the university system, but the second they know where the lab samples came from, because you got to you got to give them. We can't just put in random samples. As soon as they know where it's coming from, then we know that the interests that they work for are definitely going to not give us the the uh, stuff we need. Well, anyway, that's off and running. So that brings us to where do we go from here? Okay, we have a we have a suspicion based on some of what was in there. We, they did it. They came out with Geiger counters. They had the whole nine yards. Um, based on what those samples come back with, it's going to tell us how we have to target our remediation strategy. But here's what we do know for sure. That has to happen no matter what. Um, first and foremost, if we know the ground, and I'm just talking about soil, I'm not a, even going to get into what we have to do to remediate the water, but just the soil alone, it's going to require us to make, first of all, the best compost that is humanly possible, which we already do. The problem is we don't make anywhere near enough to do the kind of areas we're talking about. So from that compost that we make, and we're going to have to make lots of it, and I'll come to that in a minute, we're going to have to make compost extract out of that. Then we put down the extract. Now, just by virtue of putting down the extract alone, we'll tie up 50% of the toxins that currently exist just by putting down good biology. So we can tie up 50% of the toxins right there. So we do that. Step two, we take a bunch of activated biochar, put it down on top. Now, we have nowhere near enough, but we're going to have to make a bunch of it. And then we're going to have to take that biochar, which in and of itself is basically inert, but it can act as apartment complexes for the microbes, the beneficial microbes that we will inoculate it with. So we'll take that extract and we'll basically get our stuff charged up and then we'll put it down. So we basically have a compost extract. We put down our biochar, which is activated. Then we put down a bunch of carbon, probably in the form of wood chips. Because those are ubiquitous right now, considering, you know, all the trees that are down. And then all through the winter, weekly, on a weekly basis, we will have to go through and spray out bio remediation strategies, which consist of targeted, um, um, oh, shoot, how should I say it? Um, not compost tea. It's basically going to be an extract. And by that time, we should have lab results knowing what kind of organisms we need to put in there to eat up whatever it is we need to eat up. Now, if we have organisms that'll eat it up, fine. We have other organisms that'll lock it up. That's fine too. But then when spring rolls around, so weekly, we'll be going out there hitting it with an extract. And then when spring rolls around, that's when we transition into phytoremediation in addition to the things that we already have. And what that basically consists of, as the name probably indicates, is that we're going to start using plants. So, we're going to take every single remediation, phytoremediation uh, thing we could bring to bear, and we're talking all seven layers of a forest, the overstory, the understory, the shrub, the vines, anything that will eat up any toxin that we can plant out there, that's going to be next. Meanwhile, that's when we're going to transition into making a compost extract to a compost tea. And then that's when we start hitting the area with a compost tea. So once we do all of this, which seems like a Herculean task in and of itself, once we do all of that, then it's basically a management strategy. 
So it's just basically making sure we keep everything in place and then going back periodically, either hitting it with it. When things are vegetative, we want to use uh, compost teas. When they're not vegetative, we want to use extracts. And in fact, we could be using extracts the whole time because the difference between a tea and an extract in a nutshell is that the extract will permeate the soil, whereas a compost tea will is basically a foliar spray. It has oh, sticky yeah. stuff in it that will keep what we want to do is hold all of the real estate with our good guys so the bad guys can't take hold. So we're not necessarily killing anything. We're just out competing everything else. So in a nutshell, that's what the remediation strategy looks like. And as you can imagine, this is a flipping hurricane of a task. I mean, I don't know how else to say it. And... I'm basically leading the charge now. We live in a place, as you well know, where um, there's mostly people from the leftist tradition. And their typical way of doing things is, hey, let's get together, have a bunch of meetings. We don't actually do anything. And um, we're going to have a centralized point and everybody, no, 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 no. I'm like, for me to be involved, this thing has to be totally in accordance with how I govern my life. And that's from a decentralized place. So I'm not going to be taking orders from anybody. Um, we're going to figure out exactly how to do this. We'll make adjustments when needed. And we'll coordinate with other groups that are like ours. To this date, we're the only group around here that has ever attempted getting any samples, to my knowledge. But people are out there working on remediation strategies without even knowing what they're remediating. So they mean well. I had a girl come up to me the other day at a at one of the sites and saying, hey, Billy, um, we, we just planted a bunch of trees out there over there on the island. And how do I tell this girl, like, uh, you know, I basically said, good job, but you don't even know what you're remediating. Would you want to eat the fruit that comes off the trees out there? I mean, and I think they planted fruit trees to my understanding. You don't even know what you're remediating. You don't even know what the problems are. And that's exactly what we're hoping to do is to find out what these things are and then the target Sorry for the long monologue, bro, but that's it in a nutshell on how things are going. So ha have you thought about, so obviously you're going to need substantial resources. Um, you're going to need to create an inordinate amount of compost. Um, what are, what are your strategies as far as scaling? See, that's, um, See, because you're a guy that has a lot of gray matter, you're asking questions that seem like common sense, but a lot of people aren't answer answering those questions or asking those questions. Um, because permaculture, if nothing else, it just gives us a, a means to, to know what good questions to ask. So that's, yeah, that's a really good start. And nobody else is asking that question. So to basically go from where we're teaching basically uh, compost on YouTube and on Patreon, on a um, on a farm level, we're now going to have to go from making one to three cubic yards at a time to making thirty to fifty cubic yards at a time using windrow composting. Now, what does that mean? At the end of the day, we're going to have to tool up everything. But I live literally on the side of a mountain, so it can't happen here. So, as far as the strategy that I'm working on. Um, I would probably be called a genius if we can actually pull it off. So I'm praying to the good Lord and I'm going to ask everybody in your audience to pray for us as well, because what I'm suggesting here to my knowledge has never been done. And um, there's a whole lot of things that are going on right now to my knowledge that have never been done. So to your point, in order to scale this up, I'm going to need where we live. A tractor doesn't do anybody any good in these mountains. So we don't have a tractor. We're going to need a compost turner. Don't have any of those either. My compost turner has basically been me. Um, we're going to need to scale this thing up on a mechanical level. So just for a compost turner alone, right off the shelf, an inexpensive one, we're looking at $30,000 right there. A tractor. Um, you can't get some, this ain't going to be no little, you know, this ain't, we're going to need, I don't even know how many of a horse tractor, but we're going to need something with a PTO that can run that compost turner. So that's going to happen as well. We're going to need flat land, which we don't have here in these mountains, at least not right here. And the only area that seems to lend itself for me to be able to do what I want to do. 
And here's the big thing, TD. I want to do it without asking for money. I know I'm going to have to, but I got. I want to be able to do this and see how many things I can bring to bear without asking for a single dime. At, to date, so far for the causes around here, whether it was to pay the farmers who no longer, who would already be out of business had it not been some of our um, strategies already. So far, we've raised probably five hundred thousand dollars for a bakery. So far, we've raised five hundred thousand dollars. A hundred thousand went to the bakery that was defying the laws of Asheville and feeding people when they said nobody can be open right now. So a hundred thousand went to them. Two hundred thousand is going to the farmers who no longer because all the restaurants around here are farm to table. So they were buying from these farmers. Well, there's no restaurants for them to sell to. So we said, okay, we came up with a really great strategy. Uh, well, actually one lady did and I helped champion the effort was like, okay, instead of you guys selling to these restaurants, sell it to our chefs who are feeding our workers. And so we'll pay you for that. So that's exactly what we're doing. We're using the money. So the 500,000, and I'm talking about across all these different things, those are, that's where we've used this money so far. So, I'm reluctant to go back and go to the well and ask people to donate again until I exhaust everything available that's free. So my idea is I live in the town of Mars Hill. There's Mars Hill University right here. And what I'm going to do is go to them because I need to make the world's best compost. Well, they have a bunch of vacant land over there that nobody's using right now. And in fact, for months, my wife and I have been, whenever we go jogging every morning, um, we would jog by this place doing Andy Frisella 101, basically jog by this place and sit here and imagine what I would want to turn it into. And this is one of the places that was basically vacant at the college. And I was like, man, you know what? We could raise pigs right here. We could put a food forest and an orchard around here. We could run sheep through there. We could give all this stuff away. We could take all the food scraps out of their dining facility, feed all the pigs and chickens, make incredible compost we were thinking about creating a compost business over there anyway and renting the land. And we were thinking, okay, all of this was going to be done by hand. Excuse me. So now I've kind of revamped the idea is now I'm going to go to these people and I'm going to ask everybody in your listening audience that to pray that I get the wisdom of Solomon and the ability to speak in front of these people to be able to make a case in which I show them how they benefit because now I'm going to have to tweak it. Right now, the best college version of permaculture is at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. And they got a really good setup. But if they let me do the design, and I'm willing to do all of this out of my own pocket, I'm getting some of the world's best designers on the planet that are willing to partner with me. Um, you know, even people like Jeff Lawton um, that, that are willing to rock for the love, so to speak, in this project and some of his surrogates. I'm able to get them on board and I'm going to offer this college. I'm going to tell them, look, I'm going to make you the best permaculture design, permaculture demonstration site that ever existed. I want to rent this land from you. And here's what I require of you. I'm going to need your tractor whenever I need to turn this compost. And I'm going to need this land, which I don't expect you to give me. I want you to rent it to me and I want to make a 10 year lease on it. And these abandoned racquetball courts that you have over here, that's where I want to make my compost. I want to put in food forests around here instead of just having, you know, nothing and you putting endless chemicals out here. I want to show you, I'm going to basically turn this place into the envy of the planet. If you will allow me to do this now, the way you benefit is all the eggs that come out of here, I will sell them to you at a massive discount back to your dining facility. So the kids on your university, all the fruit that comes off these trees, all the berries, look, I will sell them to you for below wholesale. All I need is a place with flat ground in exchange for your tractor, in exchange for some of your real estate that I am willing to pay you for. I want you to let me turn this place into an oasis to show what can be done, what can be done um, with, with a partnership like this. So I'm going to exploit that as far as I can. Now, at the end of the day, um, TD, this is the part where it gets kind of embarrassing for me. Um, 
to do this, even if I were to make that possible. If the good Lord opens every door and makes that possible, I'm still going to need millions. And here's why. When I say millions, I'm talking millions because the sites that we are dealing with um, are enormous. We have to make so much doggone biocomplete compost. And I'm not talking about that stuff they give away at the landfill, man. I'm talking we need stuff that is absolutely biocomplete rich. And I, I've got people that are willing to work with me. And I'm going to have to learn. I'm going to have to become a quick study on how to do windrow composting, which I'm pretty sure I know how to do. It's just a matter of, you know, it's going to require some infrastructure. But to do this on the scale that I need to do it, I'm going to have to bring in employees. And I can't afford to pay these people. So this is going to require, this is a Herculean effort that has never been done before. But then again, we've never had a disaster like this before. But think about the consequences of the thing that's, even though I'm losing all kinds of sleep over here, here's what's really motivating me to do this. If I'm able to get this done, if I can create this biocomplete compost, because we know like with the Anastasia farm that's over near Chernobyl, to this day, to this day, ever since Chernobyl went off, the one place where you can't get a Geiger counter to go off is the Anastasia farm. What are they known for? Windrow composting. To this day, it is the only place in Chernobyl that is completely unaffected, and mainstream science claims that they don't know why. Well, hmm. people like you and me could say, huh, there might be correlation here. There's a bunch of freaking compost all over the place out here, and nothing is harmed. Everything is completely fine. Well, why not take that same dog to the hunt? Because we know that through these remediation strategies, whether it's phytoremediation, whether it's micro-remediation, bioremediation, which is basically all of it, when we take all these dogs to the hunt, we know that we can either come up with microorganisms that will either eat this stuff or tie it up in medium and long chain carbonic acids, which basically makes it inert. So if we can do this, what's making me motivated to make this happen is that all of a sudden, these people that have lived in these hills for a time in memoriam, for seven generations plus, guess what? They're not going to be, there's some of these people with $2 million worth of land being offered $17,000, okay? Well, what happens if somebody like me or a team of us go in there, we spray this place down, we get the right microbes on the ground, and we remediate this problem and make it better than it was before this even happened? What happens? Um, all of a sudden, this old boy ain't got to sell his land. All of a sudden, these people that are, you better hit us with a different kind of disaster because guess what? This one ain't working. So at the end of the day, I guess it's just plain stubbornness and it's the will to say, I know what you people did. I'm a little bit harder to kill than you thought. And um, I'm going to do everything for the, and at the end of the day, I know all of this will fail if I don't do it for the glory of God. And at the at the same time, I'm in a place where you you might run into one Christian for every 10 Wiccans or witches or whatever they call themselves these days. Well, the Bible says, let your light so shine before men that they see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Well, if they see what I'm able to do here, maybe that's inspiration for them to jettison the things that they're into and realize, oh, instead of worshiping Mother Earth, maybe we worship the Father who created this earth. So at the end of the day, there's there's a lot of facets here, and I hope I was lucid enough to make sense out of it, brother. Yeah, and, and the reason I think it's so relevant is we have all these other chemical catastrophes like East Palestine and Conyers, Georgia, and as these things continue to coincidentally occur over and over again, and as the ground gets destroyed, uh, if people have viable remediation efforts that don't require petrochemicals or, you know, all these other mainstream, um, you know, uh, j just like um, petrochemical fertilizers that do more harm than good. If we have regenerative practices that we can implement, even on a smaller scale, um, you know, if this process works, everyday people can do this kind of thing uh, once they learn the technique and then more people can implement it so it can help more and more people. So 
really, I see it as a case study that if you can pull it off to scale on any type of scale, as these other uh, events occur of, you know, there's a there's a real big thing going on in Conyers, Georgia right now with um, some type of explosion and everybody's getting sick and nobody's talking about East Palestine and that, you know, um, that's all these PFAS chemicals and all this, all these forever toxins. And what is so beautiful about regenerative agriculture is they have proven that they can sequester this pollution and, and bind it up to at a minimum, make it inert. And a lot of people, you know, they, they throw around this PFAS and forever chemicals and all this stuff. And it's, it's very doom and gloom if it really is forever and it can't be mitigated, but if it can be mitigated in a regenerative way, I mean, that's really good news. And, you know, and if other people just implement the same practice on their property, you know, they can repair their soil and, and really that's going to solve a lot of problems for um, everyone in general. That's why I think this is such a great idea and want to uh, shine a light on it and draw attention to it to try to give you whatever men momentum we can create and some help so that you can get the ball rolling, Coach, because it is a Herculean task that you are uh, attempting. Yeah, and I can't thank you enough also for, I mean, all the help you've given me behind the scenes. Um, that's exactly what it's going to take. But I'm glad you brought up these other places like East Palestine and Georgia. Um, and then there's a number of other super fun sites around here. I'm hoping that, you know what, maybe it was a blessing in disguise that FEMA didn't show up. Well, no, they did show up. Um, now we know why FEMA was only in the places like Asheville because they, they were told they were, and, and it's basically making headlines now, they were told, oh, don't go to any place that has any Trump signs. Well, where I live, okay, this is basically, you're going to tr find a Trump sign around every every corner. Um, Asheville, maybe that's why all the FEMA people were over there. Um, but they sure weren't out here, and nobody's seen any of them. But maybe that's been a blessing in disguise because it's showing us, A, number one, we ought to be asking serious questions about why am I paying taxes in the first place? Why is any of us playing, having to pay taxes in the first place? And number two, um, you know what? You guys, they the powers that shouldn't be created this problem. And if we can find legitimate, scalable, replicatable um, means to take whatever we do here and then pass it on like to East Palestine or to any other place where it may be declared as a Superfund site, where you're not getting any help from the government, nor at this point would I want it. I mean, because honestly, the, the, the wheels are going to move way faster through what we're doing than it ever would through a government organization. I've worked as a government employee twice in my life, and it's the most backwards. I mean, it, it, even when I was in the Army, it was like we had this little saying, there's the Army way and then the way things ought to get done. And it works that same way in the government where the wheels move intentionally slow. You got every bureaucrat in there trying to protect his own butt and protect his own interest or, you know, they're looking to climb the ladder. Look, what we want to do and what we're hoping to do, and I'm working with some people that are coming up with some pretty inter interesting technology, some of which has yet to be proven, but they're willing to come here and show me whether or not it works or things that they can combine to my compost to make it more combat effective, so to speak. Um, I'm hoping that we can bring this stuff to bear and make it so ubiquitous and so easy to where we can just roll in there, take a truckload of this stuff, make some extract, follow the same procedures we've done here, and then replicate this in every single place that might be declared a Superfund site or in places, let's say, like I was I was on the phone with Pat Militich, former UFC world champion. He's in the Hall of Fame. And, and I had no idea this dude was a soil scientist. I had no idea this guy is, you know, as squared away as he is in so many things. And he was telling me about the statistics of cancer up in places like Iowa. Well, okay, you see a correlation from all the glyphosate they're spraying mm -hmm. um, on the corn crops and stuff up there. 
and the people that are coming down with cancer left and right. Well, there's probably a correlation there. Well, maybe if we can find some mitigation strategies where we can not only revitalize or first of all, sequester or just eat up the stuff that's out there, these toxins, either tie them up, eat them up, whatever the case may be, we're treading new ground here. And honestly, it is a massive task, but if it's something that we can do here and I got the goods to show it, that's why it's so important to do the testing. And that's why, bro, this is going to blow your mind just for the initial testing. I got to somehow come up with $20,000 just to pay for the testing because, and the reason why it's so doggone expensive is because we can't get any disclosure about what was leaked into this water and on the soil. So we have to pay to test for everything, which is everything. expensive. And we're mm -hmm. talking in three different locations and multiple tests. I mean, each individual test we're talking is 2,500 bucks, bro. I mean, you know, we're not the Rockefellers here, man, but you know what? I would, the Lord will provide. He always does. And I will come up with the money, but, um, it's stuff like that where, okay, the initial testing is going to cost a lot. Once we find out what we're dealing with, now we can do testing that's going to be less expensive just because we're able to target and say, okay, are these levels coming down or are they tied up? Are they made inert? What's going on with them? We don't yet know. And so that's exactly what we're hoping to find out in all this. There is just so much, so incredibly much to try to, I mean, there's so many moving parts and I'll tell you that the sad part about all this is I can't believe the number of grifters that have just emerged out of nowhere, brother. I'm talking like all of a sudden, everybody and a great grandmother has a GoFundMe out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had this one clown come up to me at one of the disaster sites. Hey, man, I like your videos. Hey, here's my GoFundMe, man. Give me a give me a shout out on there. I'm like, what? I don't know you from Adam, homie. Um <laughs> And you're wanting me to go shout. I mean, how do I know you're not going to take this money and run off with a go-go dancer? I don't know what you're doing with it. And it's that kind of stuff that's going on. So you're seeing some of the best. You're seeing some of the worst. Um, obviously, the worst is coming from the federal government. But at least I'm hoping people are going to start asking critical questions about, man, this nanny state I belong to. Um, gee, they really aren't taking care of all my needs from cradle to grave. So if there's any good to come out of this, maybe that's some of it. Yeah, the beauty in the tragedy that I see is just watching the community come together and the churches and the locals and how they've all come together basically saying, you know, we don't need any type of federal help. We don't need assistance. Uh, we will actually perform better and get more done if you just leave us alone. I think there's a very large sentiment um, in the political world that most people and I, I realize there's this new buzz and everybody's high off of this election and, you know, oh. and all these all these platitudes and MAGA and Matt and make America healthy again and all this stuff. And and hey, maybe some of that maybe. Maybe one one thousandth of a, that stuff will actually happen. One one thousandth of one percent, which I'll I'll take it. I'll take whatever we can get. But um, from my experience and from history, and I've been around a while, um, I've seen this before. I've heard all the stuff, and usually it's more the same, and it's most of the time slightly worse, um, which is what unfortunately you know that that's what i think is going to happen but this is the beauty of what's going on where you are is hey the government don't got to do nothing get out of our way stay out of our way and we're going to get it done and we're going to mobilize and we're going to network and we're going to talk to real human beings that love other human beings and people and we're going to work together we're going to find solutions and we're going to make it happen and the the best that you can hope for from the government standpoint is that they just stay out of your way and they don't attempt to impede you, fine you, tax you, or uh, incarcerate you. Yeah, bro, but you're you're hitting on something. I'm glad you brought it up because I mean I got a lot of flack. I know you and I see eye to eye on so many different so many so many different things. Um, the one of the last podcasts I did after Trump was elected was. Immediately. I mean, and like you said, we've been around a while, you and I, 
And I've always I've been in this preparedness game for 25 years, and I've seen it over and over and over again when a Republican is elected. All the people that were into preparedness, permaculture, practical living, homesteading, they all acquiesce. And in fact, mm -hmm. all of those people out there right now in the sound of my voice, if you've been struggling to try to find a piece of land or whatever the case may be, just hold steady. Six months from now, all these people that have decided to go right back into the <laughs> the matrix, because that's exactly what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. All that land that they bought, that they thought, oh, happy times are here again. They're going to go right back into the matrix. I've seen it over and over and over again. And in fact, I lost a lot of subscribers uh, from YouTube when I went live and I said the very same thing. And I'm like, all you people doing this hopium, um, yeah. have we forgotten that Trump, I mean, yeah, granted, he's better than possibly better than the alternative. I guess the only good thing about maybe Kamala being elected, which... I don't think there was any chance of it anyway. I mean, the honest truth of it is I find it hard. Well, first of all, if you don't have the fidelity of your elections, you don't have a country. You live in a third world banana republic. So you tell me how it is in a state like mine where they overwhelmingly vote for Trump, but somehow in the down ballots, you vote for a bunch of Democrats. How does that happen? That was the fact that Trump got elected was a referendum on the very on the status quo. And then you see Carrie Lake get robbed out there in Arizona. So yeah, you may have got your president in there, but they're stealing the down ballot races. So we don't even have the fidelity of our elections. This is a third world banana republic in my judgment. And here it is. Everybody's thinking, oh, happy times are here again. Trump's getting into office. You know, I'm, I've heard him say a lot of things and I got to admit, TDI, enjoy the way he lies. Um, up until now, if anybody on this planet, in ter if you knew a friend that lied, if you knew a person that lied to you one one hundredth to the extent that the government does, they could tell you, hey, I just saw the sun rise in the east and you go out and check. Okay, how many times have we been lied to? Okay, Trump is working for the same interests. In fact, if anybody, hope I don't get you in trouble by saying this, but the truth of it is, look at that debate between Trump and Kamala Harris. There was one thing they agreed on, just one thing. I won't bring it up here because I'm not going to look to get you in trouble, but there was just one thing they agreed on. And then if you ask yourself, what was that one thing they agreed on? You might find out the people holding the puppeteer, the marionette strings are the same people that were holding both sides of these parties. Uh, the same people that control Bongino, the same people that control Hannity, the same people that control Maddow. The same people, you think there's this left-right paradigm, they're all controlled by the same people. But going back to what you were saying before, I think it's almost, it's, it's, it's scary to me because so many people have now acquiesced. Now they've said, oh, shoot, our savior has gotten in there. And that's exactly, it's almost, it's almost to the point of heresy, if you ask me, uh, the way they idolize this guy. And I'm like, okay, well, where was Trump? on Operation Warp Speed, uh, where was Trump? Not saying that he's not going to do some good things, but that's even what Machiavelli wrote in The Prince, is that you do some good things, but you also do a lot of bad things too. And it's right. and what Machiavelli recommends in The Prince is that all the bad things you do, you do pretty much all at one time, but the good things, you spread them out over time. And it's kind of slick how he did it because that's exactly how our political elite do things these days. So in light of all this stuff that's going on right now, I haven't heard Trump say anything. Okay, so talk of going back to this disaster. I haven't heard him say anything about, oh, hey, we're going to look after these people up in East Palestine. We're going to look at these people in Georgia. We're going to check out the people in Western North Carolina and Eastern Tennessee. I haven't heard him say anything, and I haven't heard anybody put his feet to the fire. Granted, he's probably got a lot on his plate. I hope and pray that I am wrong on everything I I think. I would be curious to hear your view on these things as well, because you and I haven't exactly compared notes on this, but I can I can guess based on our previous conversations. But I'm curious as to where, is everybody going back into the matrix where you are? I mean, is everybody still vigilant or how's it going? The The frustration that I have is that people will refuse to look at some, anything objectively, you know, they get so uh, pigeon 
told by the talking points and by the left right thing and it's us versus them that if you try to attempt to hold anybody accountable or point out facts it's just like it's just like football you know it's like our team versus their team and you can't just objectively look at anybody and observe what they do and what they say and you can't hold them accountable because there's all this talk about we need to hold everybody accountable. But when Trump already starts to make th these appointments like this U.N. appointment and all this stuff and his um, this Susan Wiles that he just appointed um, to is like a big pharma shill. And when yeah. people when see people see this like really shady stuff, these swamp creatures that are getting injected back into um, you know, DC, you're just like, wait a minute, this is antithetical to everything that you've been saying. And all, all I saw as this new Republican super friends alliance between the RFK juniors and the Tulsi Gabbards, all I'm watching is I'm watching the Republican party shift left. I'm watching the Overton window shift left. I'm watching the Republicans soften to eliminate their position on abortion because you know without that they're all fiscal conservatives like arnold schwarzenegger and there's never been a fiscal conservative no republican has ever conserved anything who started all that ronald reagan who started Absolutely. make american great again ronald reagan i mean this is just a ronald reagan reboot there's a reason why ronald couldn't run with barry goldwater it's because the cia hand selected you know george bush and the CIA hand selected JD Vance. Peter Thiel funded 15 million and got JD Vance elected. JD Vance is Peter Thiel's boy. And JD Vance said, Oh, yeah, I hate big tech, but he has like got massive investments with uh, biomedical. He's got huge Vivek Ramaswamy, JD Vance. They're all super mega big pharma, big pharma swamp creatures. And Maybe, hey, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe like everything has fallen into place and all these are people are great and they really do care about the Constitution. But all I've been hearing in the last three days is like Trump needs to do this executive order to free the Internet and to free free speech and all this stuff. And I'm like, well, that's unconstitutional. It's anti-constitutional. It's anti-American. It's anti-patriotic. And you can't just be cool with an executive order when your flavor of tyranny does it. And when Obama tries to do it, it's bad and he's terrible and he hates the Constitution. But when Trump does it, it's good. You know, they have a supermajority. They have they're going to have the House and the Senate. They can literally do whatever they want. They can pass whatever they want. They have the complete and total ability. There is no need for any type of executive order. But, you know, you just watch how they they always load the deck when they're dealing the cards. They load the deck. The ace is on the bottom. They know where it's at. And I I believe within the. The first probably within the first year, the whole abortion card is going to be played and that'll be used to fund. I don't know, deporting all the illegals or finish building the wall or whatever. But they've been telegraphing this stuff and. I mean, that's the weirdest thing to me is they tell you what they're going to do. You know, they always allude to it, just like Trump coming out today or yesterday and tweeting that we should help the Democratic Party because they overspent and they got a lot of bills now and we have lots of money and, you know, it'll be as a olive branch of unity. And I mean, like, dude, two weeks ago, you said that they were going to turn, turn us into communist Russia or whatever. And they were going to transgender all your kids and there wouldn't be any more elections. And now as an act of unity, we need to like bail out all their retarded spending. Meanwhile, people in North Carolina, you want to help somebody go help them. You know, you don't need to help the Democratic Party. Like what planet am I on? I don't know. It's just weird, man. I just I can't wrap my head around it. I'm right there with you. And it's like, and I, th I think you hit, so hit on something that was really key is that you can't even call these people out. It's, it's like, it's so sacrosanct that you can't even call out the inconsistencies that are obvious without people wanting to come and kill the messenger. And it's, I'm like, 
man, is it really this easy to deceive this public? I mean, it's one thing for Trump to say. Now, I'm totally with this because it's in accordance with the Constitution. Now, I can say because the, the classical definition of fascism is the alliance between corporation and state. Okay, so if you're telling me that the CIA is going out here to these or the FBI or anybody else is going to these social media platforms and saying, okay, you need to put the brakes on TV, which obviously they have on YouTube, because there were times you and I had the same numbers and all of a sudden you guys have just stopped cold in your tracks. Well, you're going to tell me that's it. No, it doesn't happen that way. That's not somebody literally had to put the brakes on you. Well, who gave that command for them to do that to you? OK, if it came from the government now, if it came from a, a corporation it, within that corporation. OK, that's fine. But it's the consummate definition of fascism if it came from a government entity. Now, if Trump wants to, you know, put the brakes on all that stuff, you knock yourself out because that is the consummate definition of fascism. You want to stop government collusion with businesses? You can stop that any day, any day of the week. But like you said, they have a super majority. You could do anything. I hear Trump floating around this idea, and I notice that hadn't been said again, that all of a sudden he's going to get rid of income taxes when he was on Joe Rogan. Okay, I'm sitting here thinking, okay, do you know who owns you? Do you know who bailed you out? Um, you're going to bite the hand that feeds you. You're going to get rid of, you notice not another word has been said about it, it was just pablum for the public. That's all it was. It was just, hey, he might get rid of um, income tax. First, it was floated around there for disabled veterans, and then it was veterans. And then on Joe Rogan, he floated it out there. Uh, yeah, we'll look at it or whatever. So now it's out in the zeitgeist, and everybody's thinking, oh, I'm like, are you, first of all, it is illegal for me to ask for any of us to have to pay income tax anyway. Don't get me started on that one. And to try to even get anybody to understand who we're paying it to. And like Mike Adams often says, why are we paying taxes in the first place when they can just print the money? I mean, mm -hmm. so Trump, if you want to do, if you want to make yourself the greatest president of all time, um, here's your opportunity to do it. Get rid of it. You got this super majority. OK, you can get rid of our income tax right now. Back to the appointments. OK, if this guy is really this serious, how come you bring in Ron Paul as an advisor when if you want to if you want the person who can destroy the Fed, the guy who wrote the book on and the Fed itself, Ron Paul himself. OK, make him your chief of staff, not that um, Wiles woman um, that is clearly a swamp creature. Um, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Yeah, he says a lot of good stuff. Huh. You really want to find out who killed JFK and RFK? Maybe put him in the Justice Department. But you know what? I think he's bought and paid for himself. Mm -hmm. Sure. Because they're, if you want to see that dude clam up, I mean, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is one of the most lucid, despite having a major disability in his throat and his ability uh, for speaking. He's still one of the most lucid speakers out there. But I have never seen that dude clam up so much until they started asking him about what's going on in Gaza. Mm -hmm. So if you want to know who's controlling all these people, who has the puppet strings and all this other stuff, you know, just ask some of these critical questions about why these appointments, because when it's all said and done, they can talk this game all they want. I want to see how many, I want to see how many swamp creatures are put right back in there just like they were the first time. Right now, he's talking a great big game. These 10 things that he's going to do to make sure there's no government collusion with social media platforms. Okay, yeah, that all sounds good if you're talking about government collusion. But you can't be telling other people how to run their business. If I don't want to, if I don't like YouTube, okay, there's other options out there. But um, like you said, just because you don't like the way he's, you don't like his brand of socialism, um, or, or Obama's brand of it, or Biden, or whatever the case may be. At the end of the day, we're here we are worried about this guy at the White House when most people don't even know what's going on in their own house. And very true. Or in their local elections. Like I said, so you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna try to tell me that here in North Carolina and in all these other states, 
We have an overwhelming vote for Trump. But meanwhile, they're pulling ballots out of the wazoo days and days later. And all of a sudden, these House seats are flipping always from Demo from Republican to Democrat. It's never going the other way. And you tell me how that's happening. We got some bigger problems. Where's Trump talking about serious election reform? Um, you know, most of that, according to our Constitution, has to be done on a state level, which I'm all for. But there are some other things that could guard the fidelity of our elections. There's a lot of stuff going on. Some of it, I would love to believe the hopium, but honestly, I don't think, I think everybody is falling for a rope-a-dope right now. Does it seem a little bit too quiet right now? It seems way too, it just seems very strange and weird. And I know that the alt media is saying that there's these coups under the surface, but there was way too much acquiescence for the, uh, the voting process and this fair and balanced election. It was very strange. And you had a lot of ultra mega libs just acquiesce. And then and then you actually had Biden trot out and he gave a very his most lucid speech. I think he's given yeah. in four or five years about how fair and honest our elections are. And is that just a mockingbird virtue signal of just so in case you thought that the elections were fair, uh, we're going to trot out this talking meat puppet <laughs> Biden who hasn't been able to string a sentence together and he wears like adult undergarments and we're going to have him give this eloquent speech about how great and it, it, we, we live in a, a very strange world. Yeah. When you get down to, when you get down to all of it, um, that's why I'm concentrating on what I can possibly do. I'm, I'm I'm working on the things I can reach out and touch. Yeah. You know, DC doesn't mean a whole lot to me. You know, kissing my little grandbaby when she was here, I'm like, okay, that that is what matters to me. Making sure that I produce the kind of progeny um you know, that just making sure that what comes out of me is helping to inspire some people to maybe do things that they didn't know was possible. Um, worrying about how to avoid, and I'm working on strategies right now about how how do I get out of ever paying taxes again? Those are some of the things we're working on right now. And as soon as I let, as soon as I get it all worked out, bro, you'll be the first to know. But I'm I'm working on some things right now to legally do what all of the rich people do through trusts, and I'm getting worked out on that. But at the same time, I'm trying to also bioremediate thousands of acres that need you know, fixed. There was a lot going on. So I'm just, you know, in spite of all this, I'm not believing anything. And I mean, I'm not believing anything that's coming across that TV screen. Well, I don't watch TV. So, but you know, anything coming out of the mainstream media, um, not believing anything. And at the end of the day, this whole tragedy has taught me Okay, you know what, bro? There's some things you need to tighten up on, communication being one of them. I didn't put a big, a whole lot of stock into it before, but now I do understand the value in it. Outside of that, when everybody else around me was sitting here, I mean, TD, it was, it was amazing. When the power was off and nobody knew when it was coming on, I'm watching people around me. Whenever I go to town, they are losing their minds, like at the mm -hmm. farm store that's near us. They were losing their ever-loving minds. And then when the power came on, it took all of about, I don't know, 10 minutes for people to go right back into the doggone matrix, just like this election. You've been up and down, up and down, up and down this whole time. And now the acquiescence that I've seen in so many people that think, oh, Trump's back in there. Well, there's that saying, you know what? There's, there's ever a slip between a cup and a lip. He ain't in office yet. And even when he is, I don't know. There, there's no way that he's going to stop this fiscal nightmare that we have going on right now. There's no way you stop this freight train. This thing is hitting a brick wall. And the only thing you were deciding in the presidency is the color of the hood ornament on the car that's about to run you over. So that's the only thing at, I think he picked out. At best case, he'll be the fall guy to blame when the dollar crashes. I mean, 
he, uh, you know, the biggest thing is, is with all this quantitative easing and these 30 or $40 trillion that's been injected into our monetary supply, the only way you fix that is to take it out. And the only way you take it out is for everybody to feel a whole lot of financial pain and for money to go from being very easy in a debt-based economy to very hard. And that will make, that will make the GDP shrink. That'll make everybody unhappy. And it would be for a shorter period of time than you just print more and kick the can down the road. But the only way you can fix that is you take it out or you collapse the dollar, it implodes, and you implement a digital currency. Yeah, and all of the above, I'm sure that's what they're, I mean, they're not going to go to gold and silver. You can believe that yeah. because you can't hypothecate those things. Yeah. So especially, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you could do it, but then you wind up like a Roman empire. Oh, mm -hmm. oh, that's exactly what we're doing. We're only doing in over just 200 years what it took the Roman empire 2000 years to do. But we're making all the very same mistakes. And uh, we just happen to be doing them worse and faster. And, you know, Rome would have been envious of an empire. And don't nobody can tell me this is not an empire. When you got 900 military bases in 130 countries, I think that makes you an empire. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, you know, thus goes to all tyrants. I mean, this thing's falling apart. And I see people going right back into the matrix. And I think this is one of the biggest robodopes. Man, I'm doubling down on my preparedness. I'm absolutely doubling down on everything I'm doing right now. Um, with the understanding that, you know what, I may have to be a lifeline for my family, my extended family. Um, these times are not going to improve. And if they do, I think it'll be short lived. I don't, I'm not trying to be a glasses half empty kind of person. I'm just being a realist in the fact that these things are unfolding right now. They have been for a long, long time. And I think the chickens are coming home to roost. I don't know that you could, I don't, I don't know how God can bless a country that is doing so many diabolical things on this planet. I don't, I don't know how that can happen. So I think the chickens are coming home to roost and maybe this is a calm before the storm, but I'm seeing this as an opportunity to shore up my preps and to get other things squared away. And maybe my timeline's off because I don't live my life as if everything's going to fall apart tomorrow, but if it does, I'm ready for that, or at least to whatever extent I can be. Additionally, um, I'm going to drive on as if this world intends to keep on driving on the way it is. Because like Gerald Salenti said, you know, who could have ever accounted for all the scams and schemes these scoundrels would have come up with over all these years? I mean, this thing should have collapsed years ago. Yeah. And then here we are, you know, um, doing doing a whole lot of awful in the world. But at the end of the day, you know what? I know who I serve, and um, I'm going to do the very best I can to be the best neighbor I can be, um, be the best teacher I can be, be the best in every way that I possibly can be, and above all else, be the best servant for the Almighty that I can be. I'm going to do those things, and um, if these chips fall in a way that I don't like or you don't like, It'll be a joy to serve in the same FEMA camp with you, my brother. <laughs> well, that's why I love you, my man. <laughs> well, this is, it's always a great discussion. I appreciate you coming on. Uh, we'll have to do this more often. And uh, I just, it, it's, it's always very enjoyable to, to listen to somebody that's not just outside of an echo chamber you know, where you can have a real discussion and talk about real solutions. I mean, that that's really, I think with the political milieu and all this stuff, I, I mean, our, my big thing and our focus is control what you control, be a good steward of what God has given you, uh, appreciate it, honor and glorify God, give him all the praise and the honor and the glory for that control what you control. Let the, the, the political stuff's going to 
take care of itself. It's going to flop however it flops, but you know, you can, you can stay up till three o'clock in the morning to wait, to see the results of an election and, and lose important sleep and be tired the next day. Or you can just go to bed because, because God, if God wakes you up the next morning, you know, he's in control. And it doesn't mean that you don't pay attention to this stuff as they try to, um, commandeer and obfuscate and all these different things but uh just control what you can control uh love your family uh be a good steward and love your neighbor and help your neighbor that's what you're doing man you, you you've taken on this herculean effort and you're using the knowledge that god has given you to the best of your ability to scale it to help more people to help people keep their property keep their land hopefully be able to grow something again and I mean, there's very few things that are more noble than that. And I greatly appreciate it. I'm going to, I am praying for you. I do pray for you. We're going to continue to pray for you. I know our listeners will be praying for you. And anytime you need any type of help getting the word out or, or pushing stuff out on social media, we're here for you. Uh, I appreciate your son. He moved up North here and he's my neighbor. So that's just another little intrinsic blessing that we get to hang out occasionally. So it's really cool, man. Uh, you're a great friend. I appreciate everything you do. And thanks for coming on. No, thanks. Thanks for having me, bro. And I look forward to having you on the show as soon as I get some daylight. We'll have to do our uh, year. We'll have to make it a tradition, man, because you and I are probably the only people broadcasting on Christmas Day. <laughs> so we'll have to do uh, our... Yeah. Uh, we remember last time we did a... Um, oh, what was it? The, uh, Misfit, the, the, the Misfit Toys or something? yeah. yeah. Yeah, we'll have Let's to do, do it. That. Yeah, we we have to make that. Uh, yeah, we'll have to market that thing. Um, yeah, since I don't do the Christmas thing, and I know you don't either, so yeah, we'll have to get together a little bit more often than the uh, Isle of Misfit Toys broadcast that we do every year. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, thanks for having me so much, bro. Um, yeah, the timing couldn't be better. I got to get down there and go get some other things hopping and popping. But thank you for so much for getting the word out because. In truth, there are so many other people around here that live in this area that are unwilling. Um, it, I could tell you, I would tell you privately, but it is mind boggling how many people are unwilling to even, you're on the other, you're in the middle of this country. I'm on the other end of it. And we're able to, ha you're willing to put your neck on the line to help me out to get this word out. And meanwhile, there are people in this community, in this state, have much bigger numbers than either one of us. Mm -hmm. And I can barely get them to even raise an eyebrow regarding any of this stuff. So I can't yeah. thank you for, um, for uh, helping me shine the light on what's going on here. And in the future, when the time's right, um, we'll put out the clarion call for whatever help we may need. And uh, whether it's in the form of finances or bodies, and I'm doing everything we can to try to make this thing as free as possible. So uh yeah, most importantly, above all else, please, folks, offer your prayers because we really need them. Yeah, we will do it. All right, y'all. Well, with that, remember, stay fearless, my friends. <laughs>